Well, Sai Ram, and thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to start out by saying a word to Swami. Dearest Swami, who is omnipresent, always with us, actually, actually with us right now. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the wonderful tech guys that put the program together and for uh, uh, Shri, Shri Shri. Uh, thank you uh, so much for bringing all of us together and for your love. And I pray that uh, you speak through me and your love comes through me and your wisdom comes through me so that we can have darshan of you and feel your presence, dear Swami. Keep us close. Sairam, everybody. The precious Vedic chanting was wonderful. The bhajans were great. And it's nice being here with you tonight. And the teachings, uh, I, I wanted to pick out two teachings to, to talk about. First one uh, is that, um, uh, that Sai is the doer. Sai is the doer. How to understand that? It's certainly not a teaching of non-action on our part. All we have to do is look at the way Swami has his students uh, action, active, full of activity, how he has uh, trained all of us to serve to uh, the highest extent, how Sai Krishna told uh, Arjuna, don't throw your bow down. No, no, no. Uh, you're Kshatriya. You have to protect Dharma. Pick up your bow and fight. But remember, I am the doer. I am, this is my play. You know, it's father, follow the father, face the devil, fight to the end and finish the game. That's what it is. It's uh, not a, an inaction, a teaching of inaction. It's a teaching of strong action. But simultaneously knowing that Swami is the doer. And the second one is that the purpose of this life is to free ourselves from the bondage to uh, birth, death, birth, death, to rise in consciousness, to a divine consciousness, to an atmic jnana, atmic reality of our own self, to realize that we are being led by Swami, to merge in Swami, to uh, to melt into Swami and to become Swami. Just to think of this idea that we could become that extraordinary, that that's who we actually are. This teaching is so extraordinary. And who comes to tell us? Somebody that doesn't only tell us in words, but is able to show us by actual dancing in our lives to waken us up. You know, Dr. Jack Hislop once asked Swami, you know, now you tell us that all of this world is a projection of our own mind. It's a play. But Swami, are you just a projection of our mind? Are you just part of the play? And Swami said, no, 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 no. I have come to wake you up out of the play, to rise you to a high level of consciousness, to merge back into me. This is a, a, a very particularly important and powerful time when we're actually being instructed by Swami to move back into him. His leaving the body, his becoming more subtle, more, more expansive, more out of reach from the sensory material world just means that he's bringing us to that level also, that he's teaching us teaching us now and guiding us to merge back into him. So I want to tell a few stories that uh, support these two teachings. And the first one is my early experiences with Swami, how I first got to know about him. Now, I've told this to many people, and so uh, please bear me out and, and um, humor me a little bit uh, because I like recalling because it makes me happy. So if you've heard it before, uh, just stick with me. I came from a medical family. And uh, when I was born, first born in the family, my father put me to his 
uh, lips and my and uh, to my ear he said, Samuel, you'll you're going to be a doctor. So uh, my uh, future was uh, uh, solidified right there on the spot. But luckily for me, it wasn't too hard to accomplish that and become a doctor. Uh, he, uh, he came from a, uh, the old country, from Poland, the border between Poland and Russia, a very, very poor area, came to the US at the age of nine, struggled very hard, didn't know English, became a doctor and eked out a good living and a, a good setting for the family. And uh, he learned to be very practical. So he wanted me to be uh, a, a internist or a pulmonologist or a gastroenterologist like he was, something very concrete. And when I told him that I wanted to be a psychiatrist, uh, he was a little bit peeved with me, but he went along with it. And the reason was because I was uh, so sensitive to the, 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 the pain and suffering of people. And I, I could see that if you talk to them and opened, opened it up so the communication was open, that so much healing could go on. And I also was very spiritually interested. You know, uh, I came from the medical family from scientific background. But when uh, I was a young teenager, I became very interested in spirituality and I began reading spiritual texts. I began reading about mystics and, and sages and saints from different religions and the Zen masters, Zen swordsmen who had an extra sensory, uh, special sensory uh, uh, feeling of uh, what was about to happen. And uh, they had one foot in this world and one foot in another world. I wondered if that other world really existed. So I wondered, uh, uh, does spirituality actually exist? And as a scientifically oriented person, I, I said, is there any evidence, you know, physical evidence that you could weigh and measure and dissect and see and analyze? Was there anything? I heard plenty of stories, but where was the evidence? And of course, great masters like uh, Buddha and Krishna and Rama and Jesus and the mystics in uh, Judaism, uh, they had the capabilities and powers, but uh, they were described, some of the miracles were described, but I've never seen one. And I thought, was it just a wishful thinking, some kind of, some kind of way of uh, bringing hope? Uh, so I went into psychiatry, hoping that uh, some of these spiritual questions would be answered. You know, where am I coming from? Where am I going? What's the purpose of this existence besides earning a living and eating some uh, potato chips and maybe a, some cereal in the morning? It, was there something deeper? And uh, could we, for God's sake, show me, please God, that there was a spiritual dimension that was real that could be palpable to you? So nine years into my practice, I began asking questions. Uh, everybody, including patients, have you ever seen a miracle? I heard of a, uh, a a Tai Chi teacher that could move you from a distance. Uh, so I thought, it doesn't interest me. No, is there really a spiritual dimension that talks about higher levels of consciousness, expanded consciousness, reaching into divine consciousness, cosmic consciousness? Could I see a miracle? Could I see somebody materialize an object? Then soon thereafter, after asking such a question, I heard about Sai Baba. And within two months after hearing, I was in India. I landed in Mumbai. And the Swami was going to be showing himself at a large stadium. 50,000 people would be there. I said I had to see that, just, just to see him in a stadium of 50,000 people. He wasn't going to be singing or dancing or anything, just to be there with people. And I was invited and the outskirts of Mumbai, a, a, a city of 17 million people, I was uh, invited uh, to an apartment to, to have some lunch and a rest before I would go to the, to the stadium. I was on the outskirts of Mumbai. And uh, on the way, you know, in the airplane, in fact, talking to devotees who were going, they said, you know, Sam, you think uh, 
from your scientific point of view that you're going to see Sai Baba and it's been your choice, but you know he's really bringing you to him. You know he's really inviting you. You're not going to see him, he's inviting you. I, I thought that was a bit odd. You know, psychiatrist hearing something like that. I Because I'd heard things like that on psychiatric ward. You know, somebody else is controlling you or in charge of your decision making. But uh, it wasn't that kind of a teaching. I just didn't understand the depth of the teaching. But uh, at any rate, I thought it was a little strange, but these people were so well-meaning and kind to me and so helpful. I went along. I got ready to leave the apartment to go to the stadium. Now, Mumbai is a town of a city of 17 million people. I, it's hard to grasp the extent of that, 17 million. But as I left the, the apartment, I went down the little elevator, came out. I was walking down toward the taxi, take a taxi uh, to the stadium. And Sai Baba comes in the car, passes me, and goes into the very same building. He passes me and goes into the very, this is my first meeting of Swami. I thought I was going to see him and he was inviting me to see, to see him and he chose the place. I, I was astounded. I wasn't a devotee at that time. I just was coming to watch and to see, but it shook me to the core. It, it was like, you know, going to Rome to see the, to see the Pope and to sitting in a coffee house uh, getting ready to go to the Vatican and time comes, I get up and I start walking out. In comes the Pope and sits in my chair. Is that kind of coincidence? It is so rare and so extraordinary that I caught myself running after Swami into this very same apartment building. Uh, he would, he preceded me, he went up to the ninth floor. I went and chased him and, and, and waited on the ninth floor. He was behind some doors with the owners of the apartment, came out. I wasn't uh, that impressed. I had seen, you know, movie stars and teachers and, and whatnot. And I just was impressed by the coincidence. It was so extraordinary. And then he left and he went to the stadium. I, I left after him. I came to the stadium late and I was uh, behind a gate, maybe 10 rows behind the gate. And I saw way out outside of the stadium, outside into the stadium, that Swami was like at the 50 yard line of a, of a football field, very, very far away. I was way back, you know, like in the outskirts of the, of the stadium. And Swami then turned and the uh, people were singing uh, bhajans. He turned and he slowly walked, 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 walked toward me, toward me, toward me, stood right in front of the gate where I was, I was 10 rows back. He stood in ecstasy. He just waved back and forth in ecstasy, eyes closed and blissful. These were my first two meetings with Swami. I had some sense of connection to him. And then we, I went to Bangalore within another day. Uh, Swami was having the first of his summer schools in Indian uh, culture and spirituality. And I was gonna be joining him at that summer school. And um, uh, it was uh, in back of the old building. I, you, you know, it's been torn down since then. And now this now Trey Burndavan is uh, built there. But it was in back and uh, uh, thatched uh, like uh, uh, leaves and uh, branches were uh, overhead. And you were sitting on chairs for long periods of time. And, and I was going to be seeing Swami in this setting. So um, I said, I'd like to see a miracle. I'd like to see him materialize something. I heard that he could materialize things. And uh, I always just missed seeing it. Somebody would say, Sam, did you see that? And I said, what, what, what? I mean, maybe I wasn't paying good attention. What, 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 uh, what, what did I see? And um, I always just missed. But one evening he was honoring a professor that had given some talks. He was so close to me, maybe 10 feet away. This hand went like this, like this, and this large, large necklace fell out of his, came out of his hand. He put it over the neck of this very humbleized <laughs> uh, professor, 
such a beautiful scene, but I was frightened by it. I was frightened because I really knew he could do this. Could a human being, for whatever, out of consciousness, out of love, out of whatever, could they will matter to change? Could they create matter? You know, for scientists, that's it's unbelievable. We just don't believe something like that. I've tried to tell scientists and they just laugh at me. Ha, ha, ha. If that really happened, that would turn science on its head, they tell me. But uh, to see somebody have the power, where did it come from? What was it? I was scared because it, it uh, sort of smashed my reality system, my belief system. And you know, your belief system is very powerful. You believe something and you want it to happen. You want it to, everything to stay that way. You do not want your belief system to shatter. Uh, I've seen people who have had their belief system shattered and they are very uncomfortable. And that's how I was very uncomfortable. I went back to my room. I looked in the closets. I looked under the bed. I was very nervous I, because what did I know now? That a human being had this power. What other power did they have? Could they actually be beyond time and space like I began to believe after my first meeting of Swami? Who could create a setting where he comes to see me in a town of 17 million people? He had to have power over time and space and be able to manipulate events. I mean, do we understand who that is, what that is, that we've had a teacher who can just tell us we're divine, he can show us by who he is, that he is in charge of our lives. He's dictating and dramatizing our lives for us, teaching us what steps we have to take to guard Dharma and take our next step to be strong, to overcome the fear of the devil. You know, follow the father, face the devil, face that thing that you're most frightened of, you know, it could be anything. Everybody has a different kind of life. Could it be that Swami is actually in charge of everybody's single life and that their dramas that they have to undergo are, are, are organized by him, given to the, you as a gift, even if it's troubling, like it was for Arjuna? How could I kill relatives and teachers on the other side? I throw my bow down. No, 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 no. This is not a teaching of the faint of heart. No, this is the time to stand up and be counted and protect the teachings of the master. That's the, the final. But uh, we have to do other things in our life. I have to prepare for a talk, for instance. I have to face the possibility of coming up with nothing, of making big errors, of looking badly in front of people. I have to do, I have to go to my school and I have to excel and do well. And, you know, there's some people that are scared of even leaving their house. You, you have to gain the, the power. Where does that power come from? To face the fears that you have, face the devil and fight. You have to, the, the, the game is partly fighting, not always fighting. We don't want to be too dramatic and too fighting and finish the game. But it's one of, of trying to excel and trying to face those things that hold us back, the things that we're most frightened of. We have to face them in some way, not all of a sudden, not too fast, not too, too simple, too little. You know, one time, uh, I don't know if I should talk about this. <laughs> well, one time I brought somebody to Swami who... Swami had materialized a beautiful diamond ring for. And this person went to the hospital, he was a doctor, went to the hospital and somebody said, ooh, that's a very pretty ring. And he says, oh, yes, uh-huh. And he says, uh, where'd you get it? And he said, I got it in India. Uh, person said, uh, is there a story? He said, no. He took it off his finger and put it in his pocket and never wore it again because he was frightened to tell that he went to Swami and he saw somebody that could materialize an object. 
you know, that's medical people especially are very prone to be worried about that. Swami materialized a beautiful ring for him. He, prior he had a, a ring with a, a gold a setting of Swami's face. And this time he made this person a diamond ring. And he said, you know, uh, you don't think about God very much, but there's got to be a balance. You've got to think about him a little bit. Not too hard so that you're obsessive, compulsive, crazy about it. Not too light so nothing happens. Just right. And you have to know that balance. It's balance, balance, balance. I remember Swami was coming to me one time in Darshan. The devotion was so powerful and the singing was so great that I was not in this world. I knew I was in a different world. It was just so, so moving and blissful. And Swami's form was so extraordinary. And he came walking toward me. And every time he took a step closer, I wanted to leap out and touch his feet. And I had to hold myself back. Not too much. You don't want to run from a darshan line and just tackle Swami. No, we have to be patient. And so he slowly, slowly walked. And you could feel it. Is it time now to touch, to jump and touch? No, no, no. No, no, no. Am I being too a passive no 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 so he came up to me and still it wasn't right and he walked behind me and he then stayed steady and i was able to put my hand in back under his robe and touch his marvelous lotus foot oh i can't tell you the extraordinary experience of such a subtle experience with swami not to aggressive, not to uh, holding off, but just right. I saw a materialization. The next thing I saw was uh, every night Swami would give a discourse and I was up early in the morning to bed late at night, strange food. It was weakening me, even though I had seen so many extraordinary things, I was in pain and thinking of going home. And I left this one uh, d an evening discourse and I went to the front of the house uh, and uh, there were five walls that separated me from Swami. And I was dejected. Swami came around the corner, around one of the walls, went right up to me with such a sparkle in his eye and gave me two pieces of candy. He said, sweet, sweets eat. And I became a puppy dog and a devotee a hardcore devotee since then. It was so sweet and the candy was very, very sweet. I thought, not thought, I knew that he was responding to my inner pain and worry and he was there for me. Extraordinary. Is he always with us? I'll tell you another story about that, but is he always with us? Yes, he's always with us. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, he camouflages himself so, so much. He camouflages himself so much. Uh, one day I was sitting in the ashram grounds and my eyes were closed and I was saying, you know, I am seeing here reality more powerful and more real than the laws of physics because I, that's what I had wanted to see. I wanted to see a, something in the physical world that I could share with, with scientists. And um, I was sort of contemplating this, uh, is there, uh, could it be that, that the reality I was seeing was so much deeper and more vast than, than the laws of physics? And as I was thinking, as I was thinking like this, I heard a rustling and I looked up and there was Swami standing in front of me in this sort of blissful pose again, just standing in front of me in this blissful pose, in touch with my thoughts. And then he left. I extraordinary. Extraordinary who this Swami is. And we have to 
protect the teachings and practice the teachings. And it means to go beyond our comfort zone at times. I'll tell you another story. You know, since then, I, I became buddies with a lot of people. I heard a lot of stories. My, my friend, Professor Kistori, told me how he was with Swami one time. And they were talking about Shiva. And, uh, uh, and Swami said, uh, you don't understand, Kistori. Look over here. And Kistori looked up and Swami transformed himself into Nanda, Nanda the bull and Shiva sitting on, on the bull. And he just looked aghast at this extraordinary vision. And then Swami came back into his own self. At one time, uh, he said to one of the devotees, you know, uh, you treat me like a friend, but you don't know who I really am. I'll show you who I am. And then one day they were out with a number of devotees and somebody was taking a Polaroid picture and they clicked it of Swami. And while it was being uh, uh, processed, somebody wanted to touch Swami. He said, no, no, don't touch me right now, too much energy. And he took the picture and he showed it to this person and it was of Dattatreya with three heads of God. And Swami was in each one of the heads. Extraordinary, just. One time Jack Hislop was telling me this story. He was at the ashram. And um, you know, he long time devotee, long life of, of spiritual interests and spiritual travel. And when he went to the uh, ashram, frequently people would ask him to speak. So uh, one day he was asked by, I think they were Italians and he went to, a, to one of the buildings and had a big meeting. And um, afterward, Swami called him up and he said, uh, Hislop, you gave a nice talk, but you confused this one person. And he described the person, he described what Hislop had said to a T. And Hislop says, you weren't there, Swami. How, how do you know that? And he thought for a second, he says, did you come to me like, a personal, uh, div, uh, a personal uh, deva, uh, a, a personal god, deity, like Ishwara. Now, Ishwara has many, many uh, aspects. Some, some describe Ishwara as beyond name and form, beyond attribute. Some say he's Shiva. But, but Jack said it this way, did you come as a personal deity like Ishwara? I didn't understand that at that time, but, but things happen in the, and I, I don't want to get into it because it's just prolonged this talk. But, but um, Swami said, no, I came to you in my omnipresence. I am every place at all times. I am every place at all times. And I'm always with you. That's how I knew exactly what happened. And Jack, one time we, we giggled together. We were in the hospital, actually. Jack was very ill and, and the devotees were gathering around him and taking care of him at the time. And I was with him in the hospital and we were giggling because he was telling all of these stories, he, how he's seen Swami turn into Krishna. And, and he knew in his bones. One time when Jack was on his deathbed, I said, well, did you see Swami today? And he said, you know, it's very important to know who to hold on to and who to see. It's more important to know what not to hold on to. Don't ever dip your hand in the stream of karma. He was, he was teaching about detachment which is at the core. You know, this idea about uh, giving up this uh, craving for and this desire for sensory, sensual activities and, and realizing that we have to detach. We're all going to leave anyways. Where did we come from before? So we know, we know that this is temporary, but we don't believe it is temporary. But Swami says, yes, the, the Buddhists say it, it's called emptiness, great emptiness. It's, it's what's left when, when all of your attachment to the 
ego aspects and to the sense aspects of life are broken. When that happens, then there's just compassion and love left. That's, that's who we really are, compassion and love. Atmik Tiana. Atmik Tiana. So uh, these are some of, the, some of the teachings. I want to tell you the time when Swami gave me something that I could really share with scientists. An extraordinary miracle in my life which makes me understand that the spiritual dimension exists, that Swami actually exists in body, in non-body, in attribute, in non-attribute, in form, in non-form. He is the highest. And I'll tell you the story. I was treating a patient for six years who had a very severe uh, headache, and seizure disorder. So bad when she got this pain, she would want to kill herself. And I'd have to hospitalize her and I'd have to put her on a locked ward. Very, very difficult, difficult patient. Uh, she, uh, I, I, we struggled for, for uh, six years. She finally had a brain biopsy at the University of Michigan, uh, University of uh, uh, California, San Diego, UCSD. Uh, I was trained at the University of Michigan, so that's on, on my mind sometimes. But UCSD, and I was in the operating room. I saw open the head. I saw him take a little piece of brain. A little vasculitis, but not enough to cause this kind of profound disability. She got a little better and left treatment. Two years later, she called me and she said, Sai Baba is visiting me. Now she knew Sai Baba because I had pictures of him in my office. Sai Baba's visiting me and he's chanting. I thought she was uh, just uh, uh, manipulating me in, in some way for some reason. And I said, um, can you remember what he's chanting? She says, I think I can. I said, could you even translate it? She says, I think I can. I said, well, if that happens again, then leave a message on my answering machine so I can hear. And uh, and, and see what you're, what you're chanting, what you're saying. And uh, two days later, I'm picking up my messages and there she is. It sounds like she's in a trance of some sort in a, in a modified consciousness. And she's chanting Sanskrit. I can understand some of the words. So I picked up a video now, I'm a trained psychiatrist. I'm not a videographer or a movie maker, but for the next two months, I collected all of her messages. I collected when she was in trance, when she was out of trance, I collected uh, her and me uh, translating the messages. She could translate them. She knew what they meant. Each message had extraordinary meaning and the totality was coherent and had an extraordinary message for, for me and for everybody, but mainly me, evidently. I uh, then sought a, a Sanskrit scholar and I called the Vedanta Society here in San Diego and they said, the best person is so-and-so, he teaches at uh, San Diego State University, but you'll never get him because he's so busy. Uh, I got him on the first ring, we became friends and we worked diligently to translate every one. There were like five Sanskrit related languages. There were uh, uh, in, in, uh, from different traditions, different kinds of concepts. This person could never have learned that. So now when it first happened, it was such a, an extraordinary event that the people at the center, our center, or people that I was talking to about it, they were very skeptical, and, and the organization is skeptical to, to, to today because it seems like it's so much like mediumship, but it's not mediumship. It's, it's something else, and uh, I don't have enough time to explain, but I went directly to Swami, and he said that the the vibhuti that was materialized uh, on her pictures, on herself, on her body, on her Bible, on the cross, and was his. And he then talked in detail about 
the languages. I'm going to just quickly go through some of the uh, meaning of the languages just to show you, uh, give you a little smattering of it because it's so powerful. Uh, and I won't get too deep into it, but a little bit, you know, the, the first message says, oh believer, embodiment of divinity, I am para Brahman. Now, I mean, would anybody ever get a message like that, a letter like that in the mail? I am para Brahman, oh believer, oh embodiment of divinity, I am para Brahman. And the next line down says Dandempa Dempa, which is a obscure Tibetan Buddhist term, which means absolute truth. You, you can perceive me through my manifestation in nature, in the material, in, in, in creation. Extraordinary. The second message says, Para Brahman is manifesting a Swami who is pure Para Brahman and is leading us in a sacrificial ceremony, a yajna for the purification of our wisdom. Well, that's in line with Swami's teaching. The third message says, and, and each of these messages are uh, uh, much more complicated and extensive than, than what I'm telling you, but, but the third message says, I am Anahata Sabda. In the Sikh religion, that means the voice of God. I am Daivi Prakriti. Daivi Prakriti is found in the Bhagavad Gita, and it means the primal mode of force. It is a luminous light, a spiritual light in all of creation that leads people toward love. And he says, it's the luminous nature of charity of immortal love. That's what, it's, that's what it says. The sixth message says, I am supreme power of wisdom. This is like the Mahavakya, the great uh, saying uh, of the Rig Veda, Pragnanam Brahman, wisdom, the highest wisdom, the highest consciousness is Brahman. The ninth message says, mind power, the mental principle is all ego and not real. We have to be very careful with mind power that is stuck in the world of duality. As much as we love it, as much as we think it can tell us all kinds of information, be very careful. It has the power to, uh, to dupe us to, to uh, turn us heads over heels, to confuse us. It has the power to change reality. It can change the external world for us. It can put thoughts in our mind. It is very, very powerful. Mind power, the mental principle is all ego, not real. Holy one, Brahman is the basis of the world. This is extraordinary to understand. Whatever your mind is thinking, if it is not in the non-dual Advaitic, complete oneness with Atmic reality, you have to be very, very, very careful. Very careful. Be, you have to be balanced and careful. The 10th message says, I have seen your suffering. I am the song of the Satya Yuga. I am the song of the Satya Yuga. Absolute peace. That's the 10th message, absolute peace. The 11th message changes, and it warns us, there is a teacher in the physical body that is not real and is non-truth. The actual words are mahamaya and, uh, and asat. There is a struggle in the mind of man about truth versus non-truth. We can see this all over the world. There is lying and cheating and non-truth all over the world. And we all have to be careful about this and stand up for truth. Teacher, there's a teacher in the physical body that is not real non-truth, is the cause of suffering. There is a struggle in the mind of man. Brace yourself and be firm upholding Dharma. Dharma means uh, protecting unity. This is another name for Brahman. The oneness, the one behind the many. Number 14, the teacher is divine wisdom. It's absolute truth. We, we have to be very careful about putting a form, uh, uh, a form as the only form of divinity. 
divinity is beyond name and form. And this one is a hard one for Sai devotees. I know I've got Swami's picture all over the place and he is an open door. Swami has said his form is different. It's actually a doorway to the infinite, to our own atmic reality. Uh, he said that he's come to wake us up. This form is extraordinarily valuable and extraordinarily precious. And if we're asked to protect teaching and name and form, it's the name and form of Swami. Absolute devotion is required. It's the brilliant sun that dispels the darkness that we're in. It leads to the awakening. There is a link between the inner and the outer. We've heard Swami say that the inner world, the mind, it projects into the external world and creates the external world. And we've also heard that the way we deal with the external world and how well we stand up for Dharma will influence wisdom in the internal world. They're linked. This is a very high teaching. I don't want to get into it too much more because we're at the end of our time. I want to, I want to thank you so much. Uh, Swami, thank you so much for being with me, bringing me through this and being with fellow devotees, being able to share things that have so much meaning for me, helping express love for you, for your teachings, how valuable, how they're the center of our life and bringing us into our own atmic reality, Swami, bringing us into such a high realm and that we're all able at this lifetime itself during the Kali Yuga, as we were transforming into the Satya Yuga, at this time, if we can just hold on and remember you, that's, that's all you're asking us to do, remember you, know that you're always with us, ever providing in this world, and the next you, you have promised us, then you, you uh, bear the burden of our welfare. Dear Swami, thank you for being with us and protecting us, being on the present. And let us keep, have a sharp eye so that we can see you and love you always. Jay Sai Raman, thank you so much.